we are going to be moving on to our last characteristic that is mentioned in verse 8. Thus far, we've actually covered the first two. The first being, we have dreamers defiling the flesh. Last week, we looked at the second one, which was they reject authority. This third one that we're going to move on to today actually goes hand in hand with this second one, with those who reject authority. In other words, if you see somebody that rejects authority, you are certain to see someone who speaks evil against the dignitary. You can't really have one without the other. You got somebody speaking evil against the dignitary, I assure you they at some level are already rejecting authority. It's just the natural ebb and flow. It's not a coincidence that Jude would bring these two things, these two ideas, right next to each other. It's very intentional. Well, we're gonna dig into this today. There's a lot to say about it. First thing I wanna bring to the table is this. As you go to the Greek, we look at this. The term for dignitaries is doxis. Simply means glorious ones, honorable ones. But there's a lot of discussion. What does Jude mean when he says doxis? What is in his mind? What is the context? What is he aiming for? Some would tell you that it's explicitly a reference to the holy angels in heaven. And you have scholars that take that position. You have other scholars that have come on the scene that really stirred the pot and basically said, actually, this is a reference to demons or fallen angels, it, it, like that of Lucifer, of Hasatan. They come from this position because of the next verse, which um, the good news is we're actually going to get to today in verse 9. And what you're going to see is there's a confrontation between Michael the archangel and the devil, okay? And they have this out, and, but it, it mentions at the end of the verse that not even Michael the archangel brought reviling accusation against the devil, and so it's interesting, there are some who interpret what's being said here is actually, well, the dignitaries mentioned are in fact would be Lucifer or uh, his minions. And that's what Jude has in mind. So we need to talk about this. The first thing I, I want you to know, the, the, the latter of what I just explained of attempting to identify a doxis as someone like the devil or uh, one of his minions, uh, it doesn't work. I mean, that's completely off the table. It doesn't work in the immediate context. It doesn't work in the broader context. And those who come to the table and say, well, this is, you know, really talking about angelic beings. I'm going to tell you right now, what Jude has brought to the table goes beyond that. It's much broader than that. It refers to the holy ones of God, to the apostles. It refers to the prophets. It refers to all the men that are like them. And yes, it would even include angelic beings. Today, I want to give you some real-life examples of what Jude is dealing with. The first one I want to give you is a personal experience of mine. And I was confronted front and center with this situation. A couple of years, several years back, I, uh, I did a debate in St. Paul. And after the debate, uh, it was a closed-door debate. After the debate, I got to mingle with some of the people that were there. And I remember speaking with a gentleman who did not appreciate what I had to say. Uh, and just so you know, the debate was over uh, whether or not Christians should keep the law. And I got into this conversation with him, and we got on the topic of Acts 10. And he countered something I had said by saying, well, Daniel, you, don't, you, you, you haven't read the Acts, the book of Acts. You haven't, you haven't studied Acts chapter 10. There it is very clear that the Lord commanded Peter to eat unclean food. I mean, he, said he, he was making the position, he was actually stating the position, you are commanded to go eat ham, you're commanded to have shellfish, you're commanded to do these things. And simply, he, he drew this from the vision that, you know, three times the sheets let down, you got all these unclean animals in it, right? And then the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And his message to me was, Daniel, rise, kill and eat. You're missing it. You're missing the forest for the trees. And I said, well, that's interesting. Did you read what happens after? 
See, because the, the immediate response of Peter was not so, my Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. But then he goes on. The text goes on. Once he comes out of the vision, you don't got to go very far. Peter wondered within himself what the vision meant. And I said that to him. And I remember like yesterday, I, I communicated. That's what he said because Peter didn't take it literally. He was bewildered. He's baffled and he's looking for an interpretation. How do I understand what I just said? This guy responded, Daniel, Peter is an idiot. I didn't even, I was stunned because I'd never heard a Christian take a position against a holy apostle, but which by the way, Peter went out and raised people who were lame from birth. He walked on water. He raised the dead. Okay, this was a guy who people were trying to get into his shadow so that they could be healed. And he's an idiot. If that's an idiot, sign me up. I want to be an idiot with Peter. If that's how you interpret an idiot. But this was his response. And I literally, the second I'm looking, I'm square in the eye and I'm hit with this passage. And actually, technically, I wasn't hit with this passage. I was hit with the companion epistle. Peter's giving the exact same message as Jude. And I remembered that there would be people who would not fear in speaking evil against dignitaries. This is what's, what you read in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. And I literally told him, I said, well, you got to be careful. Because, you know, what Peter says, that there would be certain people that would not fear speaking evil against dignitaries. And they would speak evil of things they don't understand. We can talk about living in Bible prophecy we can talk about things, but, but to be confronted literally in, an, in a real life situation where this book is talking to me, where Second Peter is coming off of the pages and I'm witnessing a Christian. He was out to defend the name of Jesus and he's calling Peter an idiot. Now, make no mistake, this was a guy who not was just, wasn't just rejecting authority, the authority of the Lord, the authority of the apostles, he was speaking evil of dignitaries. See, lawlessness will always lead to more lawlessness. It's inevitable. This is weighty. And in Judah's intent, and I've been very clear on this from the get-go, his intent is to scare the death out of you, to scare the sin out of you. And mission accomplished, Jude. It's working. I mean, these words that he's speaking, they're serious. Now, Jude is going to go on to give one of the most incredible examples that you could possibly conceive. He goes on in verse nine, he says, yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moshe dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. See, Jude really thought about his next words as soon as he got done saying, they speak evil of dignitaries. He thought about them carefully. You know, I, I think we, in, in this generation, unfortunately, Christendom on, on some levels today is at a real disadvantage when they're reading passages like this. And what do I mean by that statement? What I mean is, is I can tell you for certain in the first century, these Messianic Jews, when you brought out Michael the archangel, a whole lot of things started rolling through their mind. They knew who he was. And see, Jude is trying to hit a mark to make you literally stumble, fall on your knees in humility before God. This is the intent of the statement. It is that strong to help you appreciate where he's coming from. I want to talk about Michael a little bit so you can get a little perspective of who it is that he's brought to the table. I want to show you just a couple passages. We're going to start in Enoch 40, verse 1. And after that, I saw thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of spirits. Enoch is giddy. He's taken up in this vision and he's going into the throne room. He's going into the kingdom of God. He's about to see things no man can handle. And after that, I asked the angel of peace, who went with me, who showed me everything that is hidden. Who are these four presences which I have seen and whose words I have heard and written down? It's amazing. Enoch gets brought into the throne. He's looking at the throne. And what he recognizes is there are four presences around the Lord of Spirit, on one on each side, in the front, the back, and on both sides. And he's captivated. 
Enoch is drawn into these presences. He hears their words. But Enoch, that's not enough to hear their words. He needs to know who they are. See, these are the, these are the angels closest to the throne. These are the one in the innermost sanctum. He wants to know their names. Well, the angel's going to tell him. And get this. The first one is Michael. It's Michael. The very Michael that Jude is bringing to the table. It's Michael the archangel. Now, if that wasn't stunning enough, wait till you see his full name or how he's described in title. He's described this way, the merciful and long-suffering. Normally, when we talk about angelic beings, what are we given? We're given attributes that they were glorious and they were beautiful and they had bright light or their activities. How often are you told about their heart? How often are, do you see actual personal characteristics being described in regard to an angel. See, this brings our understanding of angelic beings into a whole nother world, into a whole nother realm. See, because for Michael to be called this, he has a heart and he is choosing to be merciful. He is choosing to be long suffering. Now, this is interesting because you go to Exodus 34, right? Verse six, the Lord comes to declare to Moses who he is. And he says, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, and long-suffering. So if you really want to appreciate what Jude is saying, he's saying this, okay, hey, be careful. You know, these dreamers, they speak evil of dignitaries, but you should wake up because not even Michael, the archangel, the highest of our angels, not even he coming against the most evil, most wicked person the universe has ever known, not even he brings a reviling accusation. Now you want to talk about putting things into context. It kind of makes you swallow hard. It's a tough thing to take in. This, this is what I'm saying. Jude is main, his intention here is to drop you to your knees. And this is where confession, and this is where humility, and this is where, God, forgive me, I have been a fool. I've acted and played the fool with my mouth. I have not done well. God, have mercy on my soul. And you pray that prayer, there is hope for you. There is mercy. There is grace. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked the video or it encouraged you, do us a favor, hit the like button, don't forget to hit the share, and if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. Now, if you wanna watch the rest of this video, hit the button here. And if you wanna watch the rest of this series, you can check it out here. And don't forget, you can download the Corner Fringe Ministries app today on any of your play stores. Thanks for joining us at Corner Fringe Ministries.